Hi guys, I'm Kasha. Welcome to our Coffee Times to talk about horror. And in case you have not noticed, and you might have been living under a rock, but the ghost with the most is back. We have Beetlejuice Beetlejuice in the cinemas now, and he's back with more humor, with more horror, and it's definitely one of those weird over-the-top movies, but I've always really enjoyed the original. And if you enjoy this kind of like weird, cheesy, chaotic, but also creepy movies, I'm here to recommend you some books and some movies that you can read and watch if you love Beetlejuice. It's coffee time! The original Beetlejuice came out in 1988 and it is a dark fantasy horror comedy and it was directed by Tim Burton and if you saw the movie and didn't know it was directed by him, you would immediately recognize because his flavor, his style is all over this movie. In the first installment of the Beetlejuice franchise, the plot revolves around a recently deceased couple. As ghosts, they are not allowed to leave their house. They contact Beetlejuice, a charismatic bio-exorcist, to scare the house's new inhabitants away. However, the original script was a lot darker than the movie that we got to see, but as the script was being like rewritten and redone, a lot of things were changed and they kind of went into another direction. They toned it down on the horror and the gore and they added a little bit more of kind of like comedy and quirky moments to appeal the weirdos and I, I'm one of those. In the original script, actually the car crash that happens at the very beginning of the film was a scene that was supposed to be like showing how they were drowning and how Barbara's uh, arm was crushed and broken when they went, you know, off this little bridge into the river. Um, so it was supposed to be a lot more intense uh, with the horror and the gore, which on one side, I'm a little bit sad I didn't get to see it, but I also understand that if they were rewriting the movie to turn it more into a comedy, that certain things might have been, you know, a clash when it comes to the tone of the film. Um, and, you know, the end product is something that I always enjoyed when I was a kid. It's one of the first Tim Burton movies that I watched when I was young. And I think it's also part of the reason why I really still enjoy it today. Um, it's also not a movie for everybody, I am fully aware. After watching also Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, I can tell you it's one of the most satisfying sequels because it came out so many years after the original, but it feels like no time has passed in a way. And the way the movie was done, you know, bringing back a lot of the cast from the original and just giving it a little bit of a fresh spin and making it available for newer audiences uh, there's a little bit more of horror in my opinion in this one and we do get to see a lot more of the world where the deceased leave and that's one of my favorite parts of the movie so I definitely recommend you guys to give it a chance if you have not seen either the original or the sequel but I'm here today to recommend you four books in four movies that you might enjoy if you love Beetlejuice. The Elementals by Michael McDowell and there is also a very specific reason why I would pick this one as my first book recommendation and it is because this is the guy that actually wrote the script for Beetlejuice and The Nightmare Before Christmas. In fact, a lot of people say that many elements from Beetlejuice came originally from this novel. The story in the book opens with the most bizarre, weird funeral of all funerals. <laughs> and that already sets up the tone for the book. And in this funeral, we also get to meet the two main families that we're going to follow. We have the McCray family as well as the Savage family. And when it comes to the Savage family, they are the ones that lost their matriarch. And after the funeral, after the loss, they decide to spend some time with one of their property. 
properties what a problem to have you have a lot of money and you have different properties and then you decide to move to a different house to spend some time there to recover and move on after such a big loss. This kind of retreat that they have is very isolated from civilization and there are three Victorian houses next to each other. One of them belonged to the Savage family, the other one to the Macrays, and the last one is an abandoned creepy house. It is a house that is abandoned, is really creepy, has a lot of like bad histories attached to it and the youngest daughter of the families, India, is very interested in this house and she goes into that house with her camera to try to take some pictures and that is where the story begins and everything changes. It is a very refreshing and interesting take in your typical haunted house story. It is a great southern gothic tale which is one of the kind of like strong points of this author and it's a book that is creepy but it's also fun and creaky. And if there is another author that combines very well horror with weird, quirky, fun, humor, it's Grady Hendrix. So I would like to recommend you How to Sell a Haunted House. The story centers around two siblings. We have Louise and we have Mark. They have a very strange relationship and the past years have only made them kind of like grow more apart from each other but then their parents die in an accident and they are forced to meet again to discuss what they're going to do with the funeral, what they're going to do with their parents' house and their belongings. The book is very focused for a long period of time on family relationships, on grief, on loss, on how to process and move on from all of that but then the second half of the book it's where the most of the humor kicks in and it's all related to a doll collection that the mother has still inside of the house and it goes completely bonkers, which is something that I know might not be for everybody. And I love that this book can be serious and talk about grief and loss and it can be even something that make people very emotional, the way that some certain things are written. But then we go to this fun side of craziness, chaos. There are paranormal things happening in this house. There are so many creepy moments. And even though it gets very crazy, I thought this book was great. This book is going to be perfect for people that love stories about grief, but also love but she crazy stories, <laughs> especially of dolls. Then I have for you Suburban Hell by Maureen Kilmer. And this is a very, like, it wouldn't be like the most original story when it comes to the characters or the plot, but it is the setting that makes this book work so well. We are in the suburbs and we meet the typical suburbs like moms and the typical neighborhood with the white picket fence and all of that and it's all fun and games until Liz, one of the moms, decides she wants to build a she shed. She wants to be the shed and she starts to dig in her backyard and in the hole that she makes a demon comes out of it. After she digs this hole, Liz starts to act weird and then terrible things start to happen in the neighborhood. So here, basically, instead of summoning a ghost, you've summoned a demon. This is almost like the Southern's uh, book club guide to slaying vampires, but toned down. It is very much light on the horror aspect, but I do think that it has a really good balance between the humor and the horror and it's going to be more for people that want like a thriller with a little bit of horror in it and not a full-on gory horror tale which is not um, what Beetlejuice is all about. The story might start a little bit like a slow burn, it's very slow at the beginning but I think it's when you get up to chapter four or five when you really have already been introduced to the different families and you start to understand their dynamics, that's when things start to get juicy. This is a more simple and cozy, fun read, but it definitely has a kind of weird aspect from Beetlejuice, that quirky fun. 
And last but not least, I wanted to recommend a book that has a little bit of the spirit of Beetlejuice, but that might be approachable for a lot of different readers, including people that normally don't read horror. And this one is more of a fantasy book, and it is The Graveyard Book by Neil Gaiman. The main character in our story is a young boy called Nobody, and he actually lives on a cemetery. And he is then kind of being raised by ghosts because those are his only friends. His family of ghosts are the ones that are going to teach him how to survive, how to defend himself, especially from the threats that are coming from the real world. This is a dark and bittersweet but at times heartwarming coming of age story and you know I thought I would give you a different option of a book of a story that still would include ghosts and how they can become family um, but in a more kind of you know fantasy and coming of age story and even though this boy lives in a world that it is not real it's such a relatable character this fantasy also has a lot of deeper meaning about childhood and growing up and trying to succeed and trying to find your way when you have had a very dark past like our boy here has had and I thought this was such a beautifully written story. It takes a graveyard to raise a child. Let's go to the movies now shall we? And one of the first ones that came to mind when I was trying to look for in my brain <laughs> for movies that are cheesy but have horror aspects to them as well which is kind of like the blend of Beetlejuice. The first one that came to mind is Little Shop of Horrors. I remember this movie and I remember I still have it in DVD at my parents house actually and I always really loved this movie because of the plant. It's so cute and I had to mention it here. It's an adaptation actually of a Broadway musical and I do understand why this movie might not be for everybody but apart from being an adaptation from the Broadway musical there was another movie um, that preceded this one also called Little Shop of Horrors from the 60s so this is also a reboot if you may of that film. The film centers on a floral shop worker. In the hopes of turning around the fortunes of his failing floral business a nerdy florist purchases a bloodthirsty plant from a Chinese street vendor. This movie is very campy, okay, it has a lot of camp, but it also has a lot of heart and I feel like it has enough horror in it as well to appeal to horror fans. One of the best things about this movie is that it blends bloody murder with romance and we even have very tragic characters and this is such an unlikely blend <laughs> um, and I think that's what makes it work so well as well. Of course the carnivorous plant is one of my favorite parts of this film. I love the design, I have multiple figures of it because I love it so much so if you have not seen it yet give it a chance. The next movie I'm going to talk to you about is part of a franchise that I think it's also very much a great example of horror combined with humor and this time around there is a lot of horror in the movie. I'm talking about the House franchise so I would like to recommend you the first installment in this franchise. The plot tells the story of a troubled author. He and his wife have separated, their only son has disappeared and his aunt has committed suicide. On top of everything else he has been pressured by his publisher to write another book. After his aunt's funeral, Roger decides to move to his aunt's house, even though his attorney has recommended it's better if he just sells the property, but he's determined to move in there thinking, maybe if I move into this house, I'm gonna get the inspiration that I need to actually write the novel that, you know, my publisher wants from me. But of course, once he gets into the house, he's gonna be plagued by nightmares. Now this is one of the most family-friendly horrors if there's ever one <laughs> that has this level of special effects and you know horror in it but it's also somehow 
a family movie because it's kind of warm and it's kind of fun and I think it's a little bit underrated to be fair. This movie had so much imagination already back in the day. I think the idea is genius and some of the horror aspects are so interesting and you know it's a lot more original than some of the movies that are being released this year. Yes I'm talking to you Blumhouse. This is for sure an 80s cult classic. Now, is it cheesy? Yes, it is. But that's kind of like the vibe of this movie. That's like at the core. It's campy, but it has also a lot of beautiful horror because the practical effects in this movie were great. And this is one that I definitely recommend you guys to try if you have not seen. Now we're going to talk about a movie that is full of ghosts and that is The Frighteners. And this movie has a very special place in my heart because I saw this movie in the cinema when it came out. I just aged myself. <laughs> I actually went on a date <laughs> to watch this movie and actually I asked the guy out <laughs> and chose the movie. I was very advanced for my time, okay? I was uh, very much ahead of my time. <laughs> um, and I think that's why it also has a very special place in my heart because the memories come back from all those many years ago. I think it's an underrated comedy from Peter Jackson. And while I do understand that some of the special effects might not have aged that well and they might look even a little bit simple today, I still think it's a lot of fun to watch. The Frighteners tells the story of Frank, an architect who develops psychic abilities, allowing him to see, hear, and communicate with ghosts. He initially uses his new abilities to get ghosts to haunt people, and then he can offer his services to people, of course for the exchange of money, and he will exercise the ghosts for them. So he's basically a scammer, that's what he's doing with his abilities, he's like, I have this beautiful power now, I must scam people. However, the spirit of a mass murderer appears posing as the Grim Reaper, able to attack the living and the dead, prompting Frank to investigate the supernatural presence. Now, I really think this movie has great rewatchability, in my opinion, because yes, it is campy and cheesy, but it is one of those comedies that included horror in a very endearing way. Um, I think this is also a family movie, definitely, and I think that Peter Jackson paid so much attention to detail when it comes to building up some tension and to the effects back in the day, and this movie got a lot of backlash. <laughs> and I know a lot of people think this is a really bad movie, but I think it's worth a watch. I think one of the best parts about this movie is that it's not boring at all. There's always some sort of mystery going on and it is a very entertaining film. And last but not least, I decided, you know, we have talked about ghosts, we have talked about even demons, so why not talk now about witches? The Witches of Eastwick is another fantastic movie that has a great cast and I know a lot of people either might have missed or they just haven't got the chance to watch it yet. The film follows three best friends who are unaware that they are witches and that their regular meetings have formed an informal coven. Without realizing it, they conjure the ideal man with a list of wishes of how he'd behave. The only problem is they forgot to specify that he shouldn't be the devil himself. So in this town we have these three women that they are desperate to find the perfect man and they conjure what they believe is the perfect man and then Jack Nicholson arrives <laughs> and he plays the character of the devil. He's very eccentric, he's very weird and different from everybody else in the neighborhood and he starts courting these three women. He buys a big mansion in the town, he moves there, nobody knows where he came from and yeah, his character is one of the reasons why this movie was so much fun and I believe this movie might not have worked as well if the cast would have been different. This movie has a runtime of around two hours, but you get sexy things, you get mystery, you get spells, there is humor, there's a little bit here for everybody. It's a silly romantic comedy in a way, so there is less horror elements to it, but again, 
I do believe that Beetlejuice is not exactly a horror movie. It does have certain creepy aspects to it because of course we're dealing with people that are deceased and especially in Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, you get to see a lot more of the deceased and the ways that they perished. <laughs> and I love it, but it's still all with a lot of humor. The movie has some interesting special effects, but do not expect from this movie a very intricate dialogue. Like it's a little bit more on the almost vulgar side. Like it is a very simple, fun movie. This is a dark comedy. It has good visuals and to be fair, at the end of the day, I do feel like this movie has a great fun portrayal of the devil who is an oddball and we have three strong women that, you know, they know what they want <laughs> and they conjure it. They just didn't expect that they would get the devil. So it's, it's fun. There you have it, guys. These were my four books and four movie recommendation for all of you that love Beetlejuice and just want more horror combined with comedy. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Let me know down below if there is any other books or any other movies that remind you to Beetlejuice. I will be curious to know. Thank you guys so much for all your support. If you want to support me in my channel directly, you can join my Patreon. The link is down below. And I hope to see you guys, as always, in the next coffee time. Bye.